Coulomb's Law. That's the title of Experience 1 from Investigation 4 on electric forces. Key objectives are to represent this law mathematically, to be able to describe and predict electric forces, as well as to describe how electric fields can explain forces at a distance. In this lab experience, you will get to explore how electric charges behave when charged objects are brought near each other. You'll get to actually see that force in action. You get to actually wield that force and control it with your movement, and later calculate it with math. Let's kick off the inquiry. Wait, wait, what was that? Who, oh, who's Coulomb? Ah, yes, of course. We'll figure that one out too. We begin with the question that presumes we understand a fundamental principle of nature, that objects can be charged. No, I'm not talking about your cell phone or your earbuds or your gaming controller being plugged in when the battery gets low. That's all related, but I mean objects that aren't electronic, objects you can't connect to an electrical outlet. I mean like synthetic materials like plastic and metals and fibers and cloths and human skin and raindrops. These are objects that can go from not being charged, which is called neutral, to having a charge or behaving as if they are charged. In physics, to say an object can be charged is saying it can be an excess amount of the property called electric charge in a way that allows it to apply a physical force on another object. So hopefully that provides a bit of context to the terminology being used here. Now, what can make this idea a challenge is that you've never seen an electric charge. However, you definitely can tell when an object possesses charge. Take a comb through your hair a few times, and you'll notice the hair start to reach up from your scalp. Wiping the comb against the hair somehow causes these objects to exhibit an electric force. So key in our demonstration, because we want to show an electric force in action, but we want to show something a tad more exciting than combing your hair. So the demo is framed by the question, what determines whether charged objects attract or repel each other. I've got an aluminum pie pan here, got a block of styrofoam and a wool or a claw. One thing I know is that I can electrically charge an object by rubbing against a material like wool. So I'm gonna do just that so I can demonstrate to you the magic of the electric force. All right, so without further ado, let's get this charge charging. So I've got just a normal piece of styrofoam and an old piece of wool. I'm going to take my time here so that I can charge the styrofoam by rubbing it with the wool. Whew. Getting a little bit of a workout right there. Okay, so I've rubbed this for about 30 seconds or so, and I'm going to take this pie pan here, and I'm going to turn it over and touch the metal to that piece. And I'm going to give it one little touch right there, then I'm gonna remove it. I don't need this styrofoam block anymore. I'm gonna move it out of the way. But I've got one more thing here, because this so far isn't very exciting, is it? And that is a little piece of tinsel. You might recognize tinsel from Christmas tree decorations, yeah? So I've taken just one little strip here, and what I've done is I have uh, tied it into a knot. Now notice it's kind of hanging straight down, right? Oh, what do you see here? It seems like it's being pulled to this pie pan plate. Hmm, interesting. Well, I'm gonna let it fall because it seems attracted. And we'll see something happen cool here. Ah, what do you notice there? It pops up. It flew away from it. Look it, it's being pulled back down. And here we've got, ah, it came straight to me. Anything here? Nope, no more. Let's see if I touch this here. Ah, there we go. Look at that. Look at that. I've got the power of the electric force in my hands. I'm wielding this power. Look at this. Amazing. I love the magic. And now that I've touched it down on something else, every time I do, it seems to lose its power. Ah, got it back just a little bit. Each time it's losing a little bit more. 
And that might be a little bit more of the trick here, huh? Because uh, when it had a lot of charge, it was really hard to control because it was attracted to so many other things around me. But now look at this. I've got this piece of tinsel and it's completely floating. Can you see it? Notice here that it's also kind of expanded itself. So what's going on here? Everywhere I move this pie pan, I'm also moving this just like magic. Ask me if you want to try this out in class someday. Notice now that I touch it, it's done. I've touched it. It won't fall back down and then spring back up. Hmm. All right then. What the heck just happened? So, why did the tinsel float? And what prevented it from falling down to the pan? Well, as you probably guessed, there was an electric force between the tinsel and the pan. And that's because the pan was given electric charge when it was placed on the charged styrofoam. And then I touched it with my finger. Don't forget that all objects are made of atoms. And atoms are made up of particles like protons and neutrons and electrons. You may recall that it's these proton and electron particles that hold the charge. Protons are positive and electrons are negative. So then, charged objects can be either positively or negatively charged, and the electric force can be either attractive or repulsive. What kind of force did you see here with the floating tinsel? That's right, repulsive, meaning the tinsel was being pushed away from the pan. The pan was positively charged after I touched it with my finger, and the tinsel became positively charged after it fell and briefly touched the pan. Once both objects had the same sign charge, they repelled or pushed away from each other. So then, why did the tinsel stop floating? I touched the tinsel, which gave it some negative charge, making it no longer overall positive. Once it no longer had the same charge as the pan, the repulsive force pushing up on the tinsel disappeared and then gravity took over. This can be summed up in the commonly heard phrase, Opposites attract and likes repel. And that means that opposite charges attract and move towards each other. And like charges repel and move away from each other. Now, I'm sure you might be a little or maybe even a lot foggy on how all of that works exactly. Like how objects become charged and what causes an object to be positively or negatively charged when you rub against it. That's okay. That's further than we need to go at the moment. But it's something you'll definitely learn about later in this experience. Let's keep the inquiry rolling and quickly bring to light the behavior of charges. Aha, yes, I'm talking about lightning, the most beautifully terrifying thing you could think of. How does electric force cause lightning to happen? Well, the moisture in storm clouds mixed with moving air causes the clouds to become negatively charged near the bottom. And then subsequently, part of the surface of the ground below becomes positively charged, and a path between these charges gets created that allow the charge to flow. Remember, opposites attract. And then you get a huge boom of electric discharge. And this lightning, this huge amount of energy. Here, check out this visual explanation. Now, let's talk about it. We got our thunderstorm right here, right? We, we are very familiar with these things. In those thunderstorms, you have updrafts, you have downdrafts, you have wind going up, wind going down, and that wind, those updrafts and downdrafts, cause the ice, the ice pellets, ice crystals in the top of the clouds to collide with the rain, and all of that collision, it's, it's just like when you're, when you're walking around a carpet and you get that static electricity, it's separating the charges. Positive charges go to the top of the storm, negative charges go to the bottom of the thunderstorm. Now, as that's occurring, Positive charges also begin to gather underneath the thunderstorm in the ground. So as all of that's happening, those positive charges begin to rise up some of the taller objects. That's why you want to stay away from tall objects when there's a thunderstorm in the area. At that same time, the negative charges begin to descend out of the base of the thunderstorm, and that's what we call a stepped leader. All of this is occurring in a very short period of time. The streamer shoots up from one of those tall objects with those positive charges. The negative charges meet in an instant. That's when the channel connects and you get lightning. That's how lightning forms. Lightning can heat the air to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
which is over five times greater than the surface of the sun. You're likely getting the picture. Electric charges cause electric forces. And these forces happen from distances. You probably are itching to get your lab exploration started. So let's get to it. The name of this inquiry lab is Electric Charges and Coulomb's Law. And in it, we ask, how does a pith ball wrapped in aluminum respond to a positively and negatively charged object? The charged objects will be a couple of rods of different material, one made of glass and the other made of plastic, either straw or PVC. Now initially, neither of these objects will be charged, not until you charge them by rubbing them with some wool or silk cloths. The pith ball is a small little ball of styrofoam that does well to become charged. By charging the rods and bringing them near the pith ball wrapped in aluminum foil, you'll explore the relationship between the strength or magnitude of electric force and the distance between two charged objects. Let's check the lab overview. You have probably heard before about positive charges, negative charges, and how charges of opposite signs attract while charges of equal sign repel each other. But what are charges and where do they come from? Atoms of all chemical elements have a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons. Protons hold a single positive elementary charge while neutrons are neutral or have a net charge of zero. Surrounding the atomic nucleus are the electrons. An electron holds a single negative elementary charge. The terms positive and negative are arbitrary. And charge or electric charge refers to the same property. What matters is that protons and electrons have a strong attraction for each other because of their opposite charges. Also, keep in mind that although a proton has a mass that is 1,836 times larger than that of an electron, both particles have the exact same amount of charge with opposite signs. In 1911, American physicist Robert Millikan quantified the charge of an electron as negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. This is the elementary charge. Since there are both negative and positive charges, the proton has a charge of 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. In your everyday lives, you have most likely experienced the forces that develop when charges of equal or different signs encounter each other. Often, during dry, colder winter days, you may feel tiny electric shocks when you touch a doorknob or other person due to transference of charges. When we walk in a carpeted room, our shoes and clothing may pick up charges, or electrons, from rubbing on the carpet. These charges will stay with us until we come in contact with a surface or object that can accept them. In this laboratory, you will investigate how objects can acquire charge by either gaining or losing electrons through interactions with other objects. Then, you will explore how objects with or without charge will react to an object that has a net positive or negative charge. The force that develops between charged objects is called electric force, and it is mathematically described by Coulomb's law which you will explore and gain a better understanding of in this investigation. Great. So, let's get to the setup. You'll grab a pith ball that has a fishing line string threaded through it and tape the free end of the string onto a metal rod that's extended from a ring stand like so. Grab a small piece of aluminum foil and try to cleanly wrap it around the pith ball. Now, you are specifically testing how the amount of electric charge affects the displacement or movement of the pith ball. So, you'll need to try to vary the amount of charge on the rod. So you're charging the rod with a cloth. How might you vary the amount of charge on the rod? Think about that one and get back to me. Anyway, 
Once you have charged the rod, bring it along the side of the ball like so, making sure you do not touch the ball with the rod at first. You should see the ball move. And when it does, you're going to measure the horizontal displacement from resting position. This means measure how far from its straight line position it moved. This might be a challenge to measure with a ruler while you're simultaneously holding the rod and trying to keep steady. In this case, hopefully you have a partner or you can ask your instructor or a classmate for help. But I would recommend placing the ruler's zero centimeter mark at the exact center where the ball was hanging vertically. And then you can measure the displacement from the zero centimeter mark. Once you have your measurement as accurate as possible, write down your data. And before you begin your next trial, touch the pith ball to the metal post of the support stand to discharge it. Always do this step between trials. Do the same with your rod like so. You can follow these simple steps with both rods. Of course, make sure you read each procedural step in the data collection section of the lab document so that you make the appropriate observations and collect the relevant data. Have fun wielding the electric force in this lab. Make observations, collect good data, and then make good analysis and conclusions. See you in the lab. <laughs>